Shalom everyone and welcome to class. We'll uh, begin continuing our study on Titus. We looked at Titus chapters 1 and 2 last class. We uh, finished Titus chapter 2 verses 1 to 14 and we will uh, look at chapter 15 and move on to chapter 3. So before we begin class and begin our study on uh, Titus chapter Two, the remaining verses, just one verse, uh, we'll begin. Pause for a word of prayer. So can I ask Kung to uh, lead us in prayer, please? Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this uh, morning. Thank you, God, that as we uh, dig in into your word, God, that you will just continue to uh, enlighten, um, enlighten us and... Uh, give more revelations uh, of who you are to us god uh, thank you lord that we would uh, apply it and um, not just hear it god but that we would be doers of your word also lord um thank you uh, for uh, everything that you're doing and uh, uh, we just ask you lord to have your way in us god in jesus name we pray amen amen thank you so uh Last week, we began our study on Titus chapter 2, and we looked at verses 1 right up to verse 14. And verses 12 to 14, we basically studied uh, three ways that uh, great strains us that Paul mentions uh, in these verses. There are three ways that grace strains us. Uh, in chapter 2, verse 12, the first half of that verse, we see that grace trains us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. And the latter half of verse 12, uh, grace trains us to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And in verses 13 to 14, um, we see that grace trains us to live in godliness by looking ahead and um, behind. We also saw that grace trains us, um, those of us who are saved, to be zealous in good works. So that's where we uh, stopped um, st our study on Titus chapter 2. We'll continue with the last verse, uh, chap chapter 2, verse 15. So can one of you please read uh, verse 15, please? Titus chapter 2, verse 15. The greatest things exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Amen. Thank you. So here uh, Paul is telling Titus, you know, uh, speak, exhort, and reprove. Now, um, uh, you know, there are he, what he's basically saying is he's indicating that there are different approaches that are needed with different people. Uh, in how to correct them and how to train them and how to admonish them. So he's saying with some people, you know, just words is all that is needed to get them back on the right path. But others need strong exhortation, while others need to be convinced or convicted of their um, wrong. So he's telling uh, Titus, you know, uh, teach these things uh, uh, and he's urging Titus to teach, exhort, and reprove uh, all that he has just shared with him or written uh, about in verses 1 to 14. Now, the word exhort in, in the Greek means parakelio. Uh, the same word, the Greek word that is used for the Holy Spirit, which is parakletos. Uh, and But here the word is para keli or para means somebody who comes alongside us. So, <clears throat> sorry, exhort is a word that is related uh, to a word used in the uh, to the Holy Spirit, which is para, uh, because the Holy Spirit is known as a parakletos, but here the word is para keli or. Uh, so, you know, somebody who comes alongside to assist us, uh, the Holy Spirit comes alongside to assist us. And um, so the whole thought of exhorting somebody is, you know, uh, the word para coming along because it's a Greek word para kelio, which means that, you know, the thought here is coming alongside someone that is doing wrong to assist them back to doing what is right. 
and uh, you know there can be a possibility of exhortation of those that know the truth but don't act upon it so you come alongside them and you just uh, encourage them you assist them uh, from you know going back uh, from you know going uh, against what is wrong and doing what is um, right so the greek word parakelio means that coming alongside somebody you know uh, who's doing wrong and helping them or assisting them to do what is um, right so here what uh, Paul is telling Titus that, you know, he must press on with much earnestness, uh, which means as ministers, you know, uh, we must not be cold um, or lifeless in delivering godly uh, doctrines, um, uh, you know, as if they were like simple things or, uh, you know, ordinary things which need no uh, exhortation which needs no force which needs no uh, earnestness and it's not important but all of these godly doctrines are very very important they're not simple things and hence we must urge them with uh, while we are teaching them or teaching these godly doctrines we need to urge them with earnestness and importance and uh, we must call upon those who are hearing or being taught these uh, godly doctrines, not just to be hearers, but also doers of the word, and only then will they be blessed. So that is the meaning of the uh, word exhort. And then he also says you need to, you know, rebuke. Uh, a rebuke is, uh, you know, basically relates to communicating with one that knows the truth, and is acting against the truth. So somebody who knows what is right, knows what is wrong, knows what is the truth, but is going away from the truth, not doing what is right, but doing what is wrong, we need to rebuke them. So it's giving them a rebuke or attempting uh, to bring them up to realize their position and the need of changing that uh, position. So it basically is relating to conviction or bringing one to be convicted of their ways, of their thoughts, of their behaviors and their attitudes uh, with words. And he's saying, uh, Paul is saying, you know, do this with all authority um, and, uh, you know, uh, teach, um, exhort and reprove with all authority. And then he ends uh, this portion of the letter by saying, you know, let no one despise you, which means let no one disregard you. So he's telling Titus that, you know, he needs to be such an example of godliness and good deeds that people will not be able to disregard whatever he's teaching, his uh, or preaching or whatever he's correcting them, rebuking them, teaching them, uh, because his way of life backs up you know, what he is preaching and he is teaching uh, them, okay? So that is the end of chapter 2. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? Okay. There are no questions. We'll move on to chapter three. Okay. Uh, chapter three. Uh, we'll begin our study of chapter three now. Uh, can one of you please read verses one and two of chapter three, please? Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, to gentle, showing all humility to all men. Amen. Thank you, Kung. So here in Titus chapter 3, basically in verses 1 following till verse 8, you know, um, uh, Paul is, uh, you know, speaking as a kind father in the faith and he is reminding um, uh, Titus and the believers at Crete of some basic uh, ways they need to behave in relation to this godless world. So he's spoken now all about uh, the church and what needs to be done in the church. Now he's moving his focus here in verses 1 to verse 8 on how they need to behave in relation to this godless uh, world. So uh, he's saying, remind them. 
you know, uh, in the, the, the Greek, uh, in the grammar of the ancient Greek uh, text, this word remain is basically in the present tense, so which means go on reminding, you know, so it's a continuous thing. You know, it just doesn't mean remind them once and then, you know, leave it. But uh, in the ancient Greek text, uh, the grammar that is used for this word remind is in the present tense, which means, you know, go on reminding. So uh, it says go on reminding them of these things because, you know, these has to be continuously be reminded or brought to the notice of the saints or believers uh, at the church at Crete. So he's saying that, you know, remind them that they have to be subject to rulers and uh, authorities. Now, uh, when we studied the book of Romans, um, I, I mentioned that, you know, the Jews, uh, you know, uh, they believed that, you know, uh, as, a, as believers of this one true God, uh, uh, they had no responsibility to the civil government and to its laws. They felt that, you know, the civil government and the laws uh, and the laws of the land uh, were purely human. They were not uh, 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 righteous. They were not holy. And since they were people who had the prophets, the laws, the covenants, uh, the testimonies and everything, you know, theirs were the prophets, theirs were the patriarchs. They, they were given the law, they were given the co uh, the covenants. So they, they taught themselves to be holy people or holy nation and, uh, you know, who were believing in the one true God and who had everything that was holy in that context. So, you know, they felt that they had only a sense of responsibility to their law, to their God, to the rituals that they had and the covenant and the you know, the promises uh, that God had given to them and they had no responsibility towards the civil government and its laws uh, because these things were purely human. But Paul says here that our witness requires us to be subject to rulers and authorities. So if we want to, if we have to be witnesses of Jesus Christ, of the gospel, then he's saying it requires us to be subject to rulers and authorities and hence he says that you know we need to respect the law of the land we need to respect the government follow the rules of the society we must obey the laws of our society and uh, <clears throat> if anything is going against the laws of god then we need to take a stand and then he goes on to say uh, be ready for every good work so apart from being obedient to the government authorities you know, he's saying that Christians have to take an active share in every good activity that promotes the welfare of the uh, community. And then he goes on to say to speak evil of no one, uh, be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. So he's saying that Christians ought to basically, you know, um, act uh, towards all in, in everyone in a good and a pleasing way, uh, refrain from, you know, attacking anyone with in, in your word or deed, be considerate, be e having a, an yielding spirit towards all. And then, you know, if anyone has tried to wrong you, you know, you need to try to resolve those conflicts or differences between uh, you and them and make peace. And he says that you need to maintain good relationships uh, with your neighbor, uh, then stand up for our own rights. So sometimes even if our rights to, uh, you know, some extent where it's okay, you know, some rights, I'm not saying all the rights are violated, no, there's some rights, you know, we just give it up just because we want to maintain good relationships with our neighbor. So he says, resolve the differences and just live in peace with one another. And he says, show humility you know, uh, <clears throat> to all men. The word humility is translated as meekness uh, and meekness does not mean weakness, but rather it just means strength under control. So Paul is saying in all your dealings with outsiders, uh, we should be under the control of the Holy Spirit, uh, responding graciously and kindly 
even when um, you know wrong has been uh, done to us. And then he goes on uh, to mention in the following verses, in verses three to eight, you know, he goes on to mention what should inspire us to behave in this way. Yes, he knows that you know we are living in an ungodly world. And the government is not very favorable to the Christians. There's a lot of persecution. There's a lot of harm done to them. Uh, there's so much of partiality. But then he says, you know, you need to, um, uh, you know, uh, be ready for every good work. You need to uh, be subject to rulers and authorities. You need to be ready for every good work and speak evil of no one. Be peaceable, gentle, showing humility to all men which was very difficult, uh, you know, in their context because most of the Christians were going through a lot of difficult uh, hardships and persecution. The persecution was very, very severe. So for Paul to say this, you know, uh, and remind them is in accordance with what the Holy Spirit has revealed to him. And he's also going on to mention you know, what should inspire them uh, to behave um, uh, this way. And he says that, you know, we, uh, he goes on to mention this in verses 3 uh, to verse 8, saying that, you know, we ourselves were uh, bad in our nature uh, uh, as uh, when we were living in darkness, even before we received salvation, but that God treated us kindly and saved us when we did not deserve it. So, you know, same way, when you look at... Uh, now you as a believer, when you look as an unbeliever and you are all angry with them and you want to react, you want to shout, you want to teach them a lesson, uh, rem remind yourself that you were in their place, in their position at one time and that God's grace was upon you and he, he treated you kindly and saved you and you received uh, salvation. So you also deal with an ungodly brother uh, or unjust brother or a uh, gentile <coughs> sorry in a in a nice gentle and patient way so can one of you please read verses 3 to 8 please titus chapter 3 verses 3 to 8 Sidan, can, can, can you please read verses 3 to 8? Or anyone else can read verses 3 to 8? Abinas? Yes, go ahead, Sidan. We have a mic problem. Anyways, anyone else can read? Anyone wants to read? Titus 3, verse 3 to 8. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice, and being hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want to I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Amen. Thank you, Asha. So in these verses, Paul is basically reminding uh, the believers, the saints at Crete, you know, who they once used to be before they became believers. And so he says, you know, that it's easy for us to become angry and impatient with unbelievers who act selfish, who act in the unjust way, in a wrong way. But if you want to behave as godly people towards them, uh, in verses 
uh, one to two, he mentions that we need to remember that before we met Christ, we also acted in that same way that these people do. That's what he mentions in verse three. Uh, so before we met Christ, he says, we lived for self. And then he says, keeping in mind how we used to be, you know, or how we need, uh, how we used to live for our own selfish desires when we were living in our old man, in our own sinful nature, you know, it will help us to, or it will enable us to treat ungodly people with grace and compassion, knowing that we were also in their place one at one point of time and how we used to behave, how we need to, how we used to live in our own selfish, um, carnal nature, evil desires, sinful passions. So when we look at them, you know, we will have grace and compassion thinking, hey, we were like that, them, you know, at one point of time, but God's grace has saved us. So we need to give, be more patient and loving towards them. And then Paul lists seven characteristics of unbelievers in these um, verses three to eight. Um, he says, you know, that uh, we were once foolish, which means, uh, you know, we did not have that spiritual understanding or spiritual wisdom because we did not know God. Uh, we thought we were wise in our own ways, but we were fools uh, when we were living in our own old man, in our old sinful nature. We were disobedient, which means we were disobedient to God, his laws, uh, and to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, the third characteristic he says of unbelievers is they are deceived. The word deceived here means uh, to roam. Uh, it is R-O-A-M, to roam, to go astray from the truth, uh, to wander from the right way uh, because of our ignorance, our unbelief, our false religious teachings, and our own lust. And then he says the fourth characteristic is serving various lust and uh, pleasures. Um, serving is like, we are we like slaves. So Paul is reminding uh, the, the believers at Crete that they were uh, at one point of time slaves to all kinds of lust and pleasures. Now, ple the word pleasures uh, is generally, as generally used in the New Testament in the sense of evil uh, pleasures. So he says that, you know, at one point of time, you were also like this, you know, um, living in all kinds of lust and evil pleasures. And then the fifth characteristic he says is we once spent our lives in uh, malice. But uh, the word malice in, in general terms basically means wickedness, evil, or all kinds of evil. But here the word malice means a desire to do harm, uh, to others as it stems from selfishness and wanting our own way, even if it means harming someone uh, to get it. So that is what the word malice here means. Malice means a desire to harm somebody else uh, because it is basically uh, uh, stemming up or rooting up from our selfishness and our wanting our own way, even if it means you know harming someone to just get what we want. The sixth characteristic, he says, is we once spent our lives in envy. Uh, we all know what is envy. You know, when we're not pleased with, uh, when we see others who are happy and prosperous, we want what somebody else has. We desire their position or whatever they have. So just, you know, we spent our lives out in envy while we were living in our old man, in our own sinful nature. And the seventh characteristic, he says, is we were once hateful, which means we lived in hatred, uh, in bitterness, in anger and unforgiveness. So he says, you know, uh, these are the characteristics of the ungodly people. And we too, before we became believers, but also uh, living like this in and had this kind of characteristics and behavior. Hence, we need to, you know, because we moved on to the side, you know, we need to understand the ungodly and just be patient and loving and gentle and kind uh, and compassionate towards them. Verse 4, he says, but when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward men appeared, which means, you know, um, even as we were living in this sinfulness and ungodly way of lifestyle, you know, we deserve God's wrath and judgment. 
but it's because of God's kindness, His goodness, His love, His mercy, and His compassion that we are saved, that He saved us. And so this verse basically gives us the basis or the cause of our salvation. The basis of the cause of our salvation is God's kindness, His love, and mercy uh, towards us. And that's what He says, you know, kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared toward, uh, uh, has, Toward man appeared. That means, you know, uh, the, the the love for mankind appeared when Jesus Christ, the eternal God, took on human flesh and came to this world and died as a substitute for our uh, sins. <clears throat> and we personally experience his mercy, his grace, <clears throat> sorry, his compassion uh, when he saved us. And hence, this verse basically tells us, you know, um, what is the basis of our salvation, which is God's kindness and his love and mercy uh, towards us. And verse 5, you know, uh, this verse gives us the effects of our salvation. What are the effects of our salvation? The effects of our salvation, as we see in verse 5, or we read in verse 5, is regeneration renewal and uh, justification okay regeneration renewal and in verse 7 the word justification is mentioned so they give us the means of our sub so this is the means of our salvation or uh, what is the effects of our salvation is regeneration renewal and justification and what is the means of our salvation the means of our salvation is the power of the holy spirit through the work of jesus christ so in this verse uh, in these verses two things we see is the effects of our salvation is regeneration regeneration renewal and uh, justification and uh, what is the means of our salvation is the power of the holy spirit through the work of uh, jesus christ so basically paul is stating here that we are when we are saved it's not the result of the works of our own righteousness. It's not the works of our own right deeds or acts, uh, which we have done, but we are saved because of his righteousness, because of Christ's righteousness that has been imputed upon us, that Christ's righteousness has been put into our account, so to say, or we are clothed with Christ's righteousness. It's not our own righteousness. It's not our own right deeds or acts, but it's his righteousness that we are saved and also that we are saved because of his mercy, his kindness, and his uh, grace. Uh, so what are the effects of our, uh, 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 our salvation? You know, the, uh, here it says, uh, you know, the, to the washing of regeneration, to the washing of regeneration. So what does this uh, uh, phrase, to the washing of regeneration, mean? Now, many comment, uh, commentators or commentary writers interpret this phrase, washing of regeneration, to refer to baptism, but that is mistaken. It's not uh, right because we see in, in the New Testament, baptism happens only after a person uh, believes and uh, repents because we see various verses. It says, repent, believe, and be baptized. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, here uh, we read it in Matthew, we read it in Acts as well, repent, believe, and be baptized. Uh, but here it does not mean that washing of regeneration is uh, referring to baptism because, you know, uh, baptism only happens after we receive a new birth. And it's a testimony of what God has done in our lives in saving us, which means that he has washed us from all our sins. So the Greek word Lutheran, uh, uh, here, which is, you know, mentioned here, you know, is uh, the word washing, the word Greek word is Lutheran, is mentioned only here in this 
uh, verse in uh, Titus chapter 3 verse 5 and also mentioned in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26 and it primarily means a vessel for bathing you know it does not mean baptism but it basically means a vessel for uh, bathing for uh, taking a bath so in Titus chapter 3 verse 5 Paul may have been thinking that is what commentary writers uh, say he may have been thinking of Ezekiel chapter 16 uh, verse 4 where God speaks metaphorically of Israel's birth as a nation and he says in Ezekiel chapter 16 verse 4 as for your birth on that day when you were born your navel cord was not cut nor were you washed with water for cleansing you were not rubbed with salt or even wrapped in cloth so that's what you know when a, when a baby is born they um, cut the uh, umbilical cord or the navel cord and they wash the baby and they rub it with salt to remove every kind of uh, you know uh, uh, skin, uh, skin that is uh, not needed or just cleanse the skin and then wrap the baby in uh, in cloth but he says you know no but uh, you know you went uh, Israel as a nation you know uh, when you were birthed as a nation no one did this uh, for you and then God goes on to say in verse 6 and he says that no one took pity on her but she was thrown in a field and left to die so like a child you know uh, Israel as a nation was just thrown as a child in a field in an open field left to die and then in uh, chapter 16 verse 6 says uh, God says you know I passed by and I saw uh, uh, Israel as a nation squirming in her blood, just like a you know, baby, a newborn baby, left in the open field uh, to die, squirming in her blood, and said to her, live. So God said, you know, I, I saw you. You know, you were dead. You were almost lifeless. You were almost dying. And I passed by, and I saw you squirming in your blood, and I spoke to you and said, live. And later on in verse uh, nine of the cha same chapter in Ezekiel chapter 16 he's uh, God tells you know how he bathed uh, her uh, with water and washed her of all her blood uh, it's a picture of how you know uh, we, uh, uh, it's a picture of how uh, we are born again spiritually when God just washes away all our filth and all our um, sins so you know the regeneration basically refers here to new birth or being born again and when God saves us you know he raises us up from uh, you know uh, from uh, from death from slavery from bondage to slavery to uh, uh, life that means he raises up from spiritual death he raises up to spiritual uh, life and this new birth that we receive it's a God's doing and it's according to his will where he basically cleanses us and washes us so you know washing of regeneration basically means you know that when we are born again how God purifies us and cleanses us of our sin just like he metaphorically talks about Israel as a nation you know how they were left dead uh, as a, like a newborn child uh, with no one to take care, cleanse, wash, you know, rub them with salt, put clothes around them. But God says, I did that uh, for you. So here the washing of regeneration is basically when God cleanses us of our sins, when we are born again and does not refer to baptism, that happens after we, you know, are born again as a testimony of what God has done in our lives. Okay, and the second effect of our uh, uh, salvation is renewal, uh, is renewing by the Holy Spirit. So this is an ongoing process of inner renewal that happens after our regeneration, that happens after we are uh, born again. Uh, so if you look at Romans chapter 12 verse 2, then Paul mentions renewal of the mind, which is an you know, ongoing process that takes place after we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. So he says, therefore, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing, and acceptable uh, uh, to God. So once we present our bodies, our minds are renewed on a continual, ongoing, day-to-day -day process. 
in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23, and Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, you know, Paul refers to putting off the new, uh, uh, refers to putting off the old man and putting on the new man who is being renewed according to the image of the one who created us. So there he talks about how we need to, you know, be renewed in the image of the one who created us by putting off the old man and putting on the uh, new man. So while God creates the new nature by the power of his spirit, you know, it's important that we must walk in the spirit, uh, that we uh, are continually giving in to the uh, desires of the spirit, the deeds of the spirit, and not giving in to the desires of the flesh or the deeds of the fl flesh. We must kill our fleshly appetites and lust and continually uh, give in to the spirit. And so he says that we must walk in the spirit and be transformed uh, through God's word in order to experience this ongoing renewal. So renewal does happen after we are born again, but it happens only when we make a conscious desire to walk in the power of the Spirit, to yield uh, to the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, and, um, you know, to live in the Spirit at, uh, um, uh, you know, at all times. And so also, you know, be transformed through God's power in order to experience this ongoing uh, renewal. And verse 6, he says, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Lord. So abundantly means richly. Um, I don't know who this person is, Metro Stars. Well, I'm not going to admit them in our class because anyone knows who has this ID called Metro Stars among the students? Okay. Uh, so here, you know, um, abundantly means richly. Uh, it just means that God poured out the Holy Spirit upon us richly through uh, Jesus Christ, our uh, Savior. So our text says that, you know, we not only have a have the spirit in small portion but that god has poured out the spirit on us richly uh, through christ jesus oh is that kennedy okay so can i admit him okay because somebody said it's kennedy i'm admitting him i really don't uh... okay thank you kung that was very helpful okay so uh, our text says that we not only have the spirit in small portion, but God has poured out the spirit on us richly through uh, Jesus Christ. Verse 7 says that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of uh, eternal life. So and other means or the other effects of our salvation, sorry, the other effects of our salvation, we looked at regeneration, renewal. The third thing is uh, the effect of our salvation is justification. Okay, so verse 7 talks about that. Um, to be justified uh, by God, you know, uh, basically Paul here uh, states that justification comes to us by God's grace and it's no way merited by our own faith. So it does not mean that we are justified uh, or made righteous by our own faith. No, it's God's uh, righteousness or his justification that has been imputed upon us. And it can we cannot, uh, you know, credit that to our faith or we cannot credit that to our good deeds, but it's basically because of Christ's righteousness, his perfect righteousness, that's the merit of Christ, which is his perfect righteousness, which has been credited to us or imputed upon us, or we are clothed or covered with his righteousness uh, uh, when we put our faith in Christ Jesus. So it's not our faith, it's not um, the merit of our faith or our works, but justification comes to us by God's grace, and thus it's no way merited by our own uh, faith. And then, you know, this verse 7 also mentions the goal of our salvation. What is the goal of our salvation? That is, that the goal of our salvation is being heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Okay, we are heirs according to the hope of eternal 
uh, life. Yes, we, as I said, you know, eternal life is something just hope for some way, way into the future. It's something that we experience even when the minute we are born again. But the fullness of the uh, uh, eternal life, you know, we will experience it only when we meet our Savior face to uh, face. So hope uh, does not convey uncertainty, but it rather uh, it, it has the fact that our inheritance is still in the future, way in the future, and it's not fully realized, but we experience a part of it uh, right now. And throughout eternity, you know, um, we will not get to the end of experiencing the riches that are in Christ uh, Jesus. Okay. Now, why does Paul, you know, go into such great discourse about or uh, uh, such great detail about discussing about our salvation? Uh, we will, uh, that is uh, mentioned to us in verse 8, where he says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works, and these things are good and profitable uh, to men. So, these things is basically, you know, everything that Paul has mentioned so far. He wants uh, Titus to continually preach with confidence the truth of the gospel so that believers will engage in good uh, deeds. And the term careful uh, or, uh, is uh, the form of the verb, you know, to reason or to consider carefully, uh, which is the, which is, uh, found only here in the New Testament, this word careful, uh, the Greek word careful here is mentioned only here in this verse, and it means uh, to reason or to consider carefully. So if we have understood the doctrine of salvation of God's sovereign grace, you know, it will motivate, Paul is saying, it will motivate us to take thought about how we can engage in good deeds or how you know, we can treat um, ungodly people or people in this world, how we can treat them uh, kindly, patiently, in humility, and also how as believers, the community of believers, we can engage in good uh, uh, deeds. So as believers, you know, uh, we must constantly think about and take lead in living godly lives uh, for the sake of the gospel and Paul affirms again that people are right with God apart from good, uh, you know, personal works. But also the goal of God for every believer is personal good works. So he's saying that, hey, you have not received righteousness because of your own right deeds or your good deeds. Uh, no, you have received righteousness because of his perfect righteousness that has been put into your account. So it's a merit, Christ's merit of his personal righteousness or his perfect righteousness that has been put into your account. That is why you have been declared righteous. And it's not because of your own personal good works. But even as Paul says that, he says it's the goal uh, of God for every believer is that, you know, uh, uh, the way that we live, uh, we need to live in such a godly way and our deeds should be such good works that, you know, it will lead others uh, to the saving grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ and will point them to this perfectly righteous one that is Jesus Christ. Okay, so that is why he's talking here in, in a little length about the whole discourse of uh, salvation because he wants to say that, you know, even though you don't receive salvation by your good works, but it's important for God that, you know, what you have received as a merit, as a favor, as, a, as grace, and as God's kindness and compassion, that will translate into good works which will lead others to Christ Jesus. Any questions uh, so far on Titus chapter 3, verses 1 to 10? Any questions? Okay, there are no questions, and we'll move on to 
uh, verses 9 to 11. Uh, can somebody read verses 9 to 11, please? Can Abhishek, Abhishek read verses? Please. Okay, Susan, go ahead. Sorry. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Amen. Thank you, Susan. So here uh, Paul goes on to talk about uh, you know, the same thing that he has been uh, mentioning again and again, you know, avoid uh, foolish disputes uh, with people who are false teachers who are talking about all of these Old Testament genealogies and, uh, you know, um, things about the law and how need, they need to keep certain kind of rituals about food and, you know, um, uh, circumcision and all that, you know, he explained quite a lot of this uh, when we studied Romans, when we studied uh, First and Second Timothy, also in Titus chapter 1. Uh, so basically, again, Paul is saying avoid all of these useless discussions because all of this is of no use, it's unprofitable, and uh, he talks about foolish disputes, genealogies, about the law. Uh, these are four descriptions, not four different errors of false teaching, but he's basically saying these are four descriptions that together describe the nature of what Titus and the believers at Crete and all believers um, may face from, uh, you know, different false uh, teachers. So he's saying, you know, foolish disputes, basically these uh, false teachers, you know, keep talking, exchanging words, um, uh, and they have no genuine, uh, you know, uh, 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 desire to know the truth, to search for the truth. They're not heeding the clear teachings of scripture. All they want to do is just, you know, talk, talk, talk some words, which is absolutely, uh, you know, foolish, which has, uh, has no end and is uh, not beneficial in any way and then he goes on to talk about genealogies and disputes of the law which i've already uh, mentioned you know all the fictitious things that they uh, have added to the old testament genealogies of these old testament saints which they want everyone to look into believe read and you know make it part of their uh, salvation experience and he says all this is unprofitable and useful and you saw the useless and he says you know what is useful is you know just preach and teach the gospel uh, of the truth uh, you know the the truth of the gospel just preach and teach that and that is more than enough don't waste your time on just debating with these um, uh, you know false teachers and then verses uh, 10 to 11 he says you know uh, reject a divisive man which reject means you know, avoid, shun, formally excommunicate, uh, you know, uh, just uh, uh, shun, avoid uh, such uh, people. But, you know, he does not mean that, you know, you need to formally excommunicate them. Just says shun them, avoid them, don't argue with them, have nothing to do with uh, them. Basically, you know, it just means have nothing to do with them. Uh, you know, either in warning or rebuking or dialogue or uh, discussion. So any of these means just don't do have anything to do with them. Don't even, you know, warn or rebuke or have any dialogue or any uh, discussion with such people, with such a dis divisive man. A divisive man basically means a man who causes division among uh, people because of their uh, teachings. And he says, you know, the first and the second admonition, which means, you know, exhort them once, twice, and if they refuse to obey, just leave them alone to their own plans. And that's why he says, you know, uh, don't even warn them after that. You know, once or twice, just tell them, and after that, don't even warn or rebuke or have any kind of dialogue or discussion with them. Okay, we'll stop here and we'll continue after the break um, with verse uh, 10 and in verse 11. Okay, enjoy your break and I'll see you after the break. Thank you, everyone.